The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents this is your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Here's an old saying you'll recognize. In union, there is strength. It appears in some form or other in ancient as well as modern literature. But it has special significance for the three and a quarter million members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Through union in the Equitable Society, they have created the security of life insurance for themselves and their families, provided education for children, helped make old age secure and comfortable. Remember, too, the premium dollars of Equitable Society members are invested in ways that promote national prosperity, so that by serving its members, the Equitable Life Assurance Society serves America. Tonight's file, The Skyway Swindle. You can cure an alcoholic, a drug addict, and sometimes you can even cure a golf player. But you'll never cure a flying man. Once he has learned to fly, his heart and soul forever after belong to the sun, wind, and stars. That is why the thousands of young Americans who flew the fighters, bombers, and transports during the war are finding it so hard to reconvert to peacetime pursuits on the ground. They know that America's civilian aviation industry cannot possibly absorb them all, and they are readjusting as best they can. But just let them see an opportunity to fly again, and, well, one young veteran of 30 missions over Tokyo saw such an opportunity recently, and here's what happened. For Bill Renton, Fairview's return flying hero... The banquets and speeches and dinner parties in his honor were all over four weeks ago. And in a way, he was glad, because he wanted to forget all about the war. But life on the ground began to get pretty dull. and was getting no better fast until the phone rang one morning. Bill answered and heard a feminine voice say, Is this Bill Renton? Yeah. The Bill Renton? That's right. Well... You don't know me, of course, but you knew my husband very well. Oh, uh... He, he flew in your squadron, Jack Martin. Jack Martin? Oh, I'll say I... I knew Jack very well. You say you're his... I mean... Uh... I'm his widow, Carol. Well, and you're right here in Fairview? I just arrived this morning. I, I, I'm at the Central Hotel. Well, gee, I... I'd sure like to see you. Well, I'd love to meet you, too. Jack's mentioned you so often in his letters. Well, then, hold everything. I'll meet you in the lobby in ten minutes. Well, I... I'm certainly glad you thought of calling me, Mrs. Martin. The name is Carol. Okay. And uh, I'm Bill. I, I guess you can understand how I like to meet and talk to anybody who flew with Jack. Oh, sure. Jack was a great guy. He felt the same way about you. Well, I... See, uh, look, Carol, it's nearly 12.30. How about our having a bite of lunch together? Oh, I'd love to. We could talk about how you happen to be here in Fairview. <laughs> Well, how I happen to be here may come walking into the lobby any minute now. Well, who's that? My Uncle George. I, I'm traveling around with him as sort of a secretary. Oh? He, uh, 
represents a group of men in the East who are planning to establish a chain of airports and flying schools over the country. I see. And they're going to put one in Fairview. <laughs> That's why he's here. Well, there's a man I'd like to meet. Why? Well, if there's going to be an airport and flying school around here, I've certainly got to get in on it. Well, I can certainly see to it you get to talk to Uncle George anyway. Gee, that's swell. When? Well, how about here at the hotel tomorrow morning? All right. What time? Mm -hmm. Ten o'clock? That's a date. Mr. Sterling, mm, yes? uh, your niece has already told me that actual operations of the airport and flying school are, well, probably still six months away. Mm, about that, I'd say. But I thought if I got my bid in early enough for a flying job, sir, well, uh... Brennan? Yes, sir? How would you like to start work right away? Right away? And how would you like to be head of the flying school? Well, I... I... And how would you like for it to be called the Renton Flying School? Now, wait a minute, Mr. Sterling. One thing at a time, I... I... <laughs> Don't misunderstand. This is not a sentimental gesture to a war veteran. Nor is it because you're a friend of my niece's husband. It's strictly business. Well, I'm afraid I don't understand, sir. My group could easily finance a hundred airports and flying schools, Renton. But we've found by experience that the community is more likely to support a thing... If it has some money of its own invested. Well, that's true, sir. Therefore, in each case, we're going to put up half the money if the businessmen of the community will subscribe the other half. Well, that certainly sounds fair enough. All right. Noon today, I'm to lay the plan before the Fairview Businessmen's Luncheon Club. I see. And if I can introduce you and tell them you'll head the flying school, the Renton Flying School. <laughs> well, I... Why, those men will subscribe for $50,000 worth of stock before you can wink your eye. The deal? Well, gee, Mr. Sterling, that's awfully flattering. No, I say, it's just plain good business for us. Fairview will have an airport and flying school. You'll be in the flying business for the rest of your life. Uh, uh, just say that last part again, Mr. Sterling. I say you'll be in the flying business for the rest of your life. <laughs> that did it. Where's the contract? In another part of the state that same morning, agent in charge Redding of the FBI field office has just finished reading a teletype from the Washington Bureau. Well, Tom, nobody can accuse this swindler of laying down on the job of reconversion. What have you got? Washington Bulletin to all officers. Who's wanted? Man about 50, girl about 26 or 7. Here's all the information on him. What did you mean about reconversion? Well, this swindler's working on a post-war angle, promoting airports and flying schools... Using a local war hero for bait. Very smart. Girl angled smart, too. She poses as the widow of a former flying mate or hero. That's how they get him. I see. But the swindler wouldn't have gotten away with it, Tom, if the people in the town had been a little bit more careful about checking up on him. How long ago did he pull the job? Three weeks ago. He'll probably strike again any time now. But far away from the last one, eh? Yes. So let's get ready for him in case he invades our district. What's your plan? Notify police chiefs. In all towns, over 7,500 without an airport. And suggest that they warn their chambers of commerce. Right. The girl is using the name of Carol Martin. Widow of Lieutenant Jack Martin. Well? well there had to be such a flyer. Let's check. See if the girl working with a swindler is the real widow. Okay. You start on that, I'll get busy alerting police chiefs. <laughs> go. It was quite successful, Carol. Quite successful. Oh, your uncle is too modest, Carol. He raised $20,000 for the airport and flying school right on the spot. Yes. And the other 30000 will be in his hands before the day is over. Oh, that's wonderful. But I can't take the credit for it, Renton. It was your name and their admiration for you that raised the money. Well, I... And now, if you don't mind, Renton, I want to dictate some letters. Oh, of course. Uh, when do you want to see me again? Uh, check with me in the morning. Right. 
Oh, uh, by the way, Mr. Sterling, I think you told me you had options at Johnson Land, south of town, for the airport. Well, that's right. I thought I'd run out there before dark and have a look at it. Well, uh, uh, I'd rather you'd wait until morning. We'll drive out together. Well, uh, all right. Whatever you say, sir. Goodbye, Carol. So long, Bill. Bye, Mr. Sterling. Goodbye. <laughs> yes, we seem to be doing all right. When do we get the rest of the money? Well, they'll have it here by 5 o'clock. Good. Then we can make the 6 o'clock train and head for the sea, sand, and sun. For where? Florida, darling. Well, that's not on my list of things to do next. Look, George, I want a vacation. Yes, yes, so do I, my dear. But we have other business to tend to first. Look, I'm withering up inside these widow's weeds. I, I want to dance and swim and roll over on the sand and watch the beautiful brutes go by for a while. Won't you ever get men off your mind? Sure, when I'm as old as you. Oh, thank you, my dear. Now, look, be practical about this. If we stick together and finish up our list of prospects, we stand to make plenty. With your half of the take, you can go anywhere in the world and do whatever you want all by yourself. That's worth waiting for. Well, Tom, anything happened while I was out? Yes, I got the information on the widow of Lieutenant Jack Martin. Oh, the girl working with a swindler is faking. I was pretty sure of that. The real Carol Martin lives in a little town in Oregon. Hasn't been away from there for ten years. Mm-hmm. I wonder how the swindler and the girl knew about us. Well, let's go to work on that. Maybe we can get a lead on a pattern of the swindler's operation. Oh, this, this teletype from Washington just came in, too. Follow up on the swindle? Yeah, he and the girl rigged another town last week. But somebody got suspicious and they made a quick exit. Where was that? Shenfield, Kansas. That's two states nearer this way than the first job. I know. Have all the notices to the police chiefs gone out? Well, it's still in the works, but they'll all be alerted before the night's over. Good. And I hope the swindler does try to pull a job in our district. I guarantee it'll be his last one. Hurry it up, George. All right, all right. Give me a hand with some of this stuff. Oh, you're worse than an old woman when it comes to packing. Come on, cram it in. Let's go. Yeah, what time do we get to Midland? Seven tomorrow night. Where's the money? Locked up in the other bag. All 50000 Do you wish to count it, my dear? I just want to get out of here. We've only got 15 minutes to make the train. We... Don't answer it. But whoever it is must have heard us talking. Go see who it is. But don't let them inside. Yeah, but suppose... Oh, hello, Bill. Going somewhere, Captain? Urgent call, Renton. I've got to go to Chicago for a few days. Too bad the flying school's not in operation. I could get you there in a real hurry. Yes. Yes, that would be a great help. But I'm afraid what I'd really do is bail out and leave you two to figure out the gadgets for yourselves. What's that? I let you two make a sucker out of me. But you're not going to do the same thing to those men who invested $50,000. Look, I don't know what you're talking about. I disobeyed orders, Mr. Sterling. I went out to look over the Johnson land. But I told you... I know. You told me you would option the land. But you were lying. Johnson says you've never even talked to him. All right, but I can explain that. Then maybe that. you can explain something else I found out. What do you mean? You said you had made a deal with Northrop to use their trainers in the flying schools. I just called Northrop, and they'd never heard of you. Now, look here. Hand over that dough, Sterling. I'll do nothing of the sort. I tell give you... Give me what... that money. Look, Renton, you're in on this, too, remember? I said give me Put that... Put up your hand, Bill. What? And don't turn around. Pick up the bag, George. Wait a minute. You've already stabbed me in the back, Carol, so maybe you'll shoot me in the back, too. But before you do, I'm gonna... Oh. Oh. He was such a sweet boy. Come on, George. Before telling you about the next exciting development in tonight's FBI file, let's talk for a moment about two very important elements in America today. Labor and management. 
This week at the Equitable Society, I was invited to accompany a group insurance serviceman to a conference between labor and management. The purpose of the meeting was to announce to a certain group of employees that their company had taken out group life insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To start the meeting, the Equitable Man told the assembled employees about the benefits they would receive under this plan. Insurance on their lives, accident and health insurance, hospitalization and surgical expenses in case of sickness or accident to themselves or their dependents. Then the president of the company told his employees that he considered this group insurance with the Equitable Society one of the best things that had happened to the company since it was founded by his grandfather over 60 years ago. When a veteran shop foreman jumped up and said he could vouch for that because he'd been with the company most of those 60 years, well, I wish you could have heard the storm of applause. I wish you could have seen the expressions on the faces of the employees. And then you'd understand why we of the Equitable Society are proud that group life insurance is an equitable first. It is one of scores of examples of this society's leadership and progressiveness. One of the many reasons why we say that this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the FBI file, The Skyway Swindle. put it mildly, it must turn the stomachs of America's returning veterans when they come back home and encounter some of the people for whom they fought, and for whom so many thousands of their buddies gave their lives. People like, to cite only one of many types, people like swindlers such as George Sterling and his accomplice, the girl Carol. Greedy, conscienceless people who scheme day and night against the possessions and human rights of others, even victimizing the very ones who fought to safeguard the country from which they suck their miserable existence. It must have been two hours after Sterling and the girl fled from the hotel in Fairview, leaving their victim, Bill Renton, sprawled on the floor. But the phone rang in the FBI field office some hundred miles away. I'll take it, Tom. Okay. Redding speaking. Oh, hello, Chief. You got our warning, eh? Was that too late? I see. Yes. Yes, go ahead. I'm getting it all right. Uh huh. All right. Good. We'll get busy right away. Yes, we'll leave here immediately. Thank you, sir. Something on the swindler? Yes. That was chief of police of Fairview calling. What happened? The same pattern. The man and the girl used a war hero for front and skipped town a couple of hours ago with $50,000. Well. The kid caught on to the swindle, went to their hotel room. They slugged him and escaped. Is he dead? No, thank goodness. How did they get out of town? Nobody knows. Come on. We're headed for Fairview. <laughs> Mr. Renton, I'm agent in charge Redding of the FBI. This is Special Agent Willard. How do you Hi. do? How's the head? Well, it's not my head that's bothering me now, Mr. Redding. It's letting those rats get away with $50,000. Well, I can understand how you feel. But after all, you were only a victim like the rest. Yes, but it was my name that raised that money. Well, let's hope we catch Sterling and the girl before they spent too much of it. Well, if we don't, I'll be working for nothing for a long time to come. I'm going to pay back every cent those men put up. How did they first contact you, Mr. Renton? The swindler and the girl. Well, she she telephoned me from the hotel. Uh-huh. Said she was Carol Martin, the widow of Jack Martin, who flew in my same squadron. Then? Well, of course, I fell for it and said I'd like to see her. 
so. I met her at the hotel, and when I asked her what she was doing in Fairview, she started telling me about this project that her so-called uncle was working on. Naturally, that interested you. Yeah, yeah. So I, well, I made a date to talk to her uncle about a job. Uh -huh. Next thing you knew, you were fronting the project, raising money through the businessmen's luncheon club. How did you know that? He's done it twice before in the same way. Did you know Lieutenant Howard Jones? Jonesy? Why, sure, he flew in the same squadron with me. Why? He was their first victim. How about Lieutenant Robert Lansing? He flew with us, too. Did they get him? He was their second victim. Well, it looks like they're going right down the line of fellows in my outfit. And those of you who live in the smaller towns, anyway. But how did they know who we were or, or where we lived? I have no idea. But we've got to get a roster of your squadron. That's about the surest way we'll have of catching him. You've got a list of the men in your outfit. No, sir, I haven't. Well, then we better contact the War Department right away. As soon as we get the list, we'll alert all the men on it. Good. I've got an idea we're going to get all of that $50,000 back for you. Well, that'll be plenty okay with me. Uh, good morning, my dear. Who's kidding who? Mm -hmm. What's the matter? Look out the window. Oh, it's just snowing a little. I'll guarantee it isn't snowing down in Florida. Come on, it's 10 o'clock. We'd better call our prospect here in Midland. Okay. What's the sucker's name? It's marked right there in the magazine article. Lieutenant Fred Bristol? That's the guy. Give me the phone book. Mm, here you are. CB. Bristol. Here it is. Yeah. Um. Operator, I want uh, 6087, please. That's right. That magazine article was really something. I don't know how much the author made out of the glorious record of that squadron, but I feel like sending him a bonus for including a roster of the heroes. Anytime you send anybody a bonus for anything, great heart, I'll buy you a bit. Oh, uh, hello? Is this Fred Bristol? The Fred Bristol? Well... You don't know me, of course, but you know my husband very well. He flew in your squad. I sure wish that teletype would start sounding off, Tom. So do I. My hands are pretty well tied until that roster comes in. The swindlers may have already reached the scene of their next job, too. Yes. One good thing for us, though, it takes them a couple of days to set the stage and cash in. Oh, it doesn't take us longer than that to start. Uh-uh. There she goes. Oh, let's have a look. Following his list of men who served in... This is it. Get Barnes and Kennedy in here. Okay. Tell the switchboard operator to keep six trunks clear for us. We're going to get on long distance and stay on it until we make a strike. <laughs> Right, we'll keep on the alert anyway, Lieutenant, thanks That's six for me, Redding, and all blanks Take six more names, start again Okay Contacted 14 names by long distance, no luck We're narrowing the field anyway Get some more, keep going Right Another batch of names, Barnes. See what you can come up with. Ready. Yeah, Tom? We're in. Oh, here comes Uncle George now, Fred. Good. Uh, I'm awfully sorry, young man. I was late for our breakfast appointment. Oh, I'm sure you're quite busy, sir. Mm, so you're Lieutenant Bristol. Ex Lieutenant. My niece spoke to me about you yesterday, Bristol. Said you were interested in the connection with the airport and flying school we plan to establish here in Midland. Yes, sir. Bristol, how would you like to be head of the flying school? Head of it? And how would you like to have it called the Bristol Flying School? Well, gee, I... Now, this I... is not a sentimental gesture to a war veteran. No, because you were a friend of my niece's husband. It's strictly business... Uh, and... uh, pardon me for interrupting, sir. How's that? There are two gentlemen just coming into the dining room. I'd like to have meet you. Oh, 
Interested in the project, perhaps? Oh, yes, sir. Well, here they are. Good morning. Good morning, Bristol. Uh, Mrs. Martin, and Mr. Sterling... I'd like you to meet Mr. Redding and Mr. Willard. Well, how do you do? Won't you join us for a bite of breakfast, gentlemen? Mr. Bristol tells me that you're interested in the airport project, which brings me to Midland. We're quite interested, Mr. Sterling, but... Then uh, do sit down, by all means. I should be glad to explain it to you, and perhaps... Well, that we... won't be necessary, Mr. Sterling. We're quite well acquainted with it already. Really, sir? Yes. You see, Mr. Willard and I are special agents of the FBI. <gasps> FBI? Yes, that's right. And if you are interested in the project that has brought us to Midland, we should be glad to explain it to you. <clears throat> if I may quote you, sir, that won't be necessary. I'm well acquainted with it already. George Sterling and his accomplice, Carol were tried in a federal court for their cruel swindle. They were both sentenced to long terms in a penitentiary. The swindler, the cheater, is one of the most loathsome species that crawls in the criminal scum of any society. And he is numbered by the thousands. But his whole breed could be wiped out overnight, for he lives solely by preying on the carelessness of his victims. The simple exercise of due caution in dealing with and checking on the stranger with a proposition, this one step alone on the part of each of us could exterminate the swindler. Next week, the Equitable Society will bring you another exciting and thought-provoking case from the files of your FBI. Before telling you about it, let me remind you that just as you look to your FBI for national security, so to the Equitable Society you look for the financial security of life insurance. Yes, like the FBI agent, the Equitable Society life insurance representative in your community is a specialist on the subject of security. His job is to preserve homes, to help keep children in school and to make old age a time of happiness and contentment. It's a good job, and one that has won for him the respect and confidence of his fellow citizens, who recognize his contribution to the security of you, your home, and your country. <laughs> Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Paroled Killer. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Parole Killer. On this is your FBI. ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.